Strictly Stalking is a platform that gives stalking survivors an opportunity to share their stories and no longer have to suffer in silence. Now we are speaking up for George Floyd and the countless other African Americans who have lost their lives to police brutality and systematic racist violence. We encourage you to join us in donating at blacklivesmatter.com to support the ongoing fight to end state-sanctioned violence, liberate black people, and end white supremacy forever. It's time we all make our voices heard in the fight for justice and equality for all black lives. And he told me before I ran away the final time, he said, if you ever escape me or tell anyone what I did, I will hunt you for the rest of my life and I will kill you. But he invested everything in finding me and terrorizing me. He fed off of my fear. I'm Jamie Beebe. And I'm Jake Deptula. On today's episode of Strictly Stalking, we will hear from actress Kate Romero, detailing how her ex-husband stalked her for over 44 years and how she fought back to reclaim her life. We'll also hear from Roz Hedietian, a therapist and mental health advocate who helps stalking victims deal with their trauma and provides insight on why people stalk. She'll also be sharing some helpful tips on how to cope if you are being stalked. Welcome to the show, Kate. Let's hear how this all began. My mother actually has seven children and we all have different fathers. Um, she was very beautiful redhead with green eyes and high cheekbones and freckles. When I was six months old, my mother just gave me away to strangers while my father was away at work on a work trip. And when he came home, he didn't know where I was. And she said she had to give me to somebody because she didn't want me to infect my siblings with measles. And she didn't wow. really didn't know who she'd given me to. Turns out it was a family named Snodgrass. And uh, my father took a couple years to find me through the courts. And when he found me, he brought me back to the family and the family that didn't want me and then promptly died of a massive heart attack two weeks later. Wow. And in the interim, while he was looking for me, he had created a will that said, if I don't live under the same roof, roof as my mother, should anything happen to him, that my mother would not get his pension. So every time I ran away as a child, uh, she had them bring me back because I was, you know, basically the breadwinner of the family just because the will, that was a clause in the will. And um, when I was four, my mother took a boyfriend. His name uh, was Rocky. He is, he is now deceased. Um, but he started molesting me when I was four and my mother knew about it and he proceeded to do that until when I turned 17, he informed me he was going to kidnap me and take me to Florida and marry me because he knew that my mother didn't want anything to do with me. She didn't protect me at all. And I had no one to turn to and I was terrified and I knew he would do it. I knew. I just didn't know when. And I was working as a car hop in New Lebanon, Ohio at the time. And he's told me this information and I'm really, really bummed. And there was a older man who drove a 1964 gold Cadillac uh, who would always come to my station. Every time it was my shift, he would be in my station and he would always order a peanut butter and chocolate uh, malted. And I would love to go make it for him and he would drink it and we would talk and then he'd give me a $5 tip. So it was about three months of doing that. And then this, this day when I went to work after hearing what you know, my mother's boyfriend was about to do. He says, why are you so down? And I said, uh, you know, I didn't really want to tell him, but what do I got to lose? Right. So, and so I told him and I told him every time I ran away, I ran away my first time when I was five years old in the, in the ghetto of Detroit, Michigan, it was safer out there than it was in our apartment. Um, and so I, I told him that every time I ran away, they had the police bring me back because my mom got money if I lived under her roof. And he said, well, I know what to do. I know a justice of the peace in um, Jackson, Tennessee. And you lie about your age, say you're 18, because I was 17 at the time. And he said, he'll marry us and, and it'll be a platonic business deal. As soon as you turn 18, I will give you an annulment and you'll be free for the first time in your life. And they cannot make you come back. You'll be considered an adult. So we talked more about it and then we made a plan and we made a plan for November 7th, 1973. 
And the plan was I come home from high school and I act like there's nothing weird. But that morning when I went to school, I wore a dress that I would like to get married in. And I didn't change my clothes after school like I normally would. But I took out the trash and I just kept walking. And I hoped that he wasn't waiting for me. And I hoped that he was. And so um, I get in his car. We drive through the night. Eight o'clock the next morning, we go into the justice of the peace. I lie about my age. We get married and immediately takes me to the nearest bar. I had never drank before. And he ordered in uh, honor of his gold Cadillac, a golden Cadillac drink for me, which is cream and brandy and nutmeg. And I had three of those. So anyway, closed the bar down. I guess he spent pretty much all of his money. We hadn't discussed where we're going to stay. We hadn't discussed anything beyond getting married. So we drove through this area, which I later learned was called the red light district, where people go to, you know, do drugs and, and prostitution and rent hotel rooms by the hour. And he talked a hotel manager into letting us stay in one of their rooms that smelled like um, lilacs and urine. And it was really nasty, nasty room. Um, I'd never seen him drunk before, but he was really grouchy and like like just cussing a blue streak. And, and then he laid down on the bed and passed out. And I was feeling sick, so I went in the bed- bathroom and I threw up because it was I felt horrible. And then he's passed out on the bed and I tiptoe back in and I leave all my clothes on and I pull up the bedspread and I crawl in as quietly as I can. And I no sooner got the bedspread tucked in around my chin as he he came to life and jumped on me like a circus freak and ripped my clothes off and he raped and beat me that night. And he raped and beat me for 18 more months after that. I ran away from him several times, but he always found me and brought me back. And he told me before I ran away the final time, he said, if you ever escape me or tell anyone what I did, I will hunt you for the rest of my life and I will kill you. And I knew that if I didn't somehow get away, I I was just going to be dead sooner or later. So I might as well take my chances and get away. And and if he kept his promise to keep hunting me, then that I would just have to deal with that. And he did keep his promise. I uh, moved to Arizona and joined the army so I could disappear. Every time I had a new address and being the dutiful citizen, I would, you know, go to Social Security and change my address like you're supposed to do every time you move. And he had a friend working there or a fellow criminal. I don't know if he had any friends, um, but he had someone working there that would tip him off every time I changed my address. He would send me nasty cards with pictures of himself flipping me the bird with his hair in his face drunker than uh, you know, just drunk and saying, um, I know where you live and I'm, I'm going to kill you. And those would come intermittently and he would he would get my little sister, my baby sister, to tell him where I'd moved to. And she always told him. So I would be I was married with a child when he drove from Dayton, Ohio to Hollywood, California, banged on our apartment door and told me to come out that I'd been gone long enough and it's time for me to come home now because I was his wife. Wow. And how many years later was that? Well, my son was nine years old and I was married to his father. And I I handed my son's father the baseball bat to to like get him. And he handed it back to me and I thought, okay, I did not marry well this time either. So uh, I called the police and, and he went back to Dayton and and uh, he kept following me everywhere. Every time I moved or changed my phone number, I would get flowers with a, a card saying, I know where you live. I would, he would call me and prank call me on my new phone number, private. I went underground to the extent that I didn't even do the census. But he invested everything in finding me and terrorizing me. He fed off of my fear. The more underground I went, the more he found me and the more joy he seemed to extract from terrorizing me. A year and a half ago, I was doing a charity uh, speaking engagement where I was sharing my courage, strength, and hope with with the people who bought a ticket to come there for the fundraiser. And he sent somebody to pull me off stage. And the people who were running the charity had to sneak me out the back door. They had to keep him out. They called the police. and And it just became a really big problem. Uh, so I started making phone calls along with my husband to find out what my rights were. And every police station I called, detectives, you name it, they just said, we don't handle that, ma'am. We don't handle that. I'm going to take this into my own hands. 
So I kept calling, calling, calling everyone that I could. And I was told that I could file a restraining order and I wanted a permanent one. I know it's just a piece of paper, but Mm -hmm. it's also peace of mind. And so uh, I started stalking the stalker. He um, ended up living at his deceased mother's house where he and I lived for a little while. So I couldn't remember exactly what the address was. And I saw in my mind's eye what the road name was. And then I Googled that road, and then I saw his mother's name who owned the house, and I remembered that was her name. So I got the address, and I went and I filed a restraining order, and we uh, had the sheriff deliver it. And once he, I mean, I was trembling. I was so scared. It's poking a a nest of rattlesnakes. I don't know what he's going to do. And when you file a restraining order, you are in more danger then than if you do nothing. So your life is really in danger when you take action Mm -hmm. and you turn the tables on the stalker. And so we did that and uh, he cried holy hell about it. It's like he fought it, he fought it, he fought it. First there's a temporary restraining order and then there's a permanent one, you have a hearing. Mm -hmm. So we're at the courthouse and we thought, well, he's not gonna show up. I'm gonna get my restraining order. The court told him he could call in on speakerphone from Dayton, Ohio, which is what he did. But he had to pay $85 every time he did it. (laughs) So it's getting expenses for him if he's he's almost a vagrant. And he's actually uh, 74 years old right now. Wow. And as far as I know, he's still alive. And uh, he called in every time on speakerphone. And I had to hear his voice every time for 10 months on speakerphone until the final day. And... In the interim, I had gotten in touch with um, Judge Rosemary Acalina, Mm -hmm. who is the judge who sentenced Larry Nassar, the pedophile, to 175 years in prison and signed his death warrant, basically, by doing that. Uh, She and I became friends, and she told me that I should write my victim impact statement. As long as I wanted to be, I'm allowed to read it, even if they try to get me not to. I have the right to read that victim impact statement. And it was ended up being like 25 minutes long. And so we're in the bathroom texting each other. She's in Michigan and she's texting me right back. I'm, I'm, I'm saying the judge is acting like he's siding with the predator. What am I going to do? She goes, no, he's not, honey. What he's doing is he's keeping your, your case pristine in case something happens where they have to revisit it, that he did not cause any doubt whatsoever that he was, you know, fair-handedly taking care of this case. So I said, okay, all right. And so the judge did ask the predator questions like, why is it that you don't want this restraining order to take place? Why are you trying so hard to set it aside after all these months of postponing it and trying again, trying again, trying again? And he said, because, Your Honor, I'm a citizen and I'm allowed to own a gun and I can't own a gun if I have a restraining order against me and I want to bring my gun to California. And my eyes got big like saucers and I'm like, see? Yeah. And the judge just looked at me and just, you know, he was trying to have a poker face, but I could see something change in his eyes. Like we're not dealing with a full deck in this guy. And um, he said, well, w- what do you want to do? He said, I want to come to California and I want to face her and I want to I want to sort this out and the judge says well if you come here you have to bring eyewitnesses and you have to have a very very good case or this could go badly for you you could end up in jail and it could, it could cost you a lot of money and that's when I knew the judge was like trying to see what he had and if he was going to come and so he just listened to that and then I told the judge Uh, that this guy had come to my home in Hollywood from Dayton, banged on my door and told me to come out. I'd been gone long enough. And and my son yelled through the door, nobody here by that name. And he made fun of my son when he said, oh, yeah, I did do that. And and the judge said, why did you do that? He said, because I wanted to see what she looked like. 
When it came time for me to read my victim impact statement, my knees were knocking, my hair was bouncing up and down on my head because I was trembling so hard, and my voice was cracking and I was crying, but I still read the entire thing. And there was one point where uh, the court reporter had stopped typing because she was so listening to all the things he had done to me. Finally, push came to shove, and the, after I finished my statement, the judge said to him, so what do you think about that? And he said, well, I don't know what to think about that. And you know what? I'm tired. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm tired. And I said, Your Honor, would you please grant me the restraining order with prejudice so we cannot come back and try to set it aside again? He said, what do you think about that, sir? He said, I don't care anymore. And so I got my restraining order with prejudice, meaning he can't come back and and try to set it aside. And that day he heard in my voice, even though I was trembling, even though I was crying, he heard that I wasn't afraid of him anymore. And what I learned on that day is that my fear was keeping this stalking alive. Had I confronted him sooner and showed him I wasn't afraid, it would have stopped sooner. And on May 31st, 2018, I was free for the first time in my life. And my husband and I walked out of that court with our restraining order and we're going to refile when it, when, you know, in five years when it expires, we'll keep refiling as long as he's alive. And have you heard from him at all since you got the restraining order? He knows better. I was stalking him on on uh, social media mm-hmm. under uh, uh, a, a different account. He has had six wives who were 17 when he groomed them into marrying him. His last one, he went to the Philippines and got her. They all divorced him because he abused them. He did all that while still stalking me. How has your life changed now that you're no longer being stalked by this man? I'm 63 today, and that started when I was 17 with that guy. And because I'm ready now, and I'm just really starting my life, I actually got five agents in the same day for every line of creative endeavor that I've always dreamed of doing. Um, I'm booking things constantly. Uh, The reason that all these agents signed me on the same day is because I was resonating the frequency of I'm freaking ready. I'm writing a memoir called How I Busted Out of My Genes and Changed My Life Story Forever, G-E-N-E-S. And uh, it tells everything. And I've learned so much about psychology because of him, but I'm not giving him any credit. I survived this whole thing. Not, and and it didn't make me stronger that I went through this with him. I just am resilient. And I believe we all are. And when you feel like you have a sense of purpose in the world, then, then you're gonna do whatever it takes to keep yourself safe, as safe as you can. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today, Kate. Now we'll be chatting with mental health advocate and blogger Roz Hadashian to get some insight on how our listeners can avoid someone like the predator Kate had to deal with for most of her life. She received her master's degree in clinical psychology with an emphasis in marriage and family therapy and professional clinical counseling from Pepperdine University. While Roz was able to listen to Kate's interview before we sat down with her, she does not know Kate and cannot speak to her exact situation. Instead, she'll be giving us advice on how we can see the red flags in relationships and learn to fight back and become a survivor like Kate did. Roz, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Cool. Uh, So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, who you are, what you do? So I just graduated from Pepperdine University's uh, graduate program. Uh, I got my master's in clinical psychology with an emphasis in marriage and family therapy. And I'm also a mental health blogger, just trying to raise awareness and, you know, add to the conversation on destigmatizing, seeking therapy and all that. So Roz, what kind of clients do you handle? I'm in between. I'm waiting for my associate number, for my associate therapist number. So until then, um, I'm not really seeing clients, but I was seeing a lot of college students um, that at a community college at West Los Angeles. What's the process like when someone needs to seek help for something? 
There's a lot of resources um, these days, a lot more than before. I think in terms of mental health, we've been really moving in a positive direction. Um, there's you know, ways to reach out to your insurance company to see what therapist uh, they can provide for you. There's also a really good directory called Psychology Today that um, you know, has different therapists in your area with their different specialties that uh, people could reach out to. And it's, it's a process a lot of times with therapy. Um, you know, the therapeutic relationship is the most important part. So sometimes, you know, if it's you go in for the first time and it doesn't feel like it's the right fit, you should just try to see somebody else because connecting with the therapist is really a huge uh, factor in uh, effective therapy outcomes. What are some red flags that people can look for so they don't get into some kind of relationship that's, you know, going to turn out maybe similar to Kate? You know, it's really complicated, like given her life story, that really plays a role in it because when you're coming from a situation in an abusive home and an abusive family, it's unfortunately, it's not uncommon for people like that to find themselves in another abusive situation and for that pattern to continue until, you know, they seek help or they, you know, become aware of it. Uh, people, predators, people who are stalkers often target people like that, people in vulnerable positions that they can prey on. And of course it doesn't start off as aggressive and scary. They, you know, the situation starts off with little things here and there and suddenly it escalates. And I think it's important to try to stop it before it escalates. Then, you know, you really have to start seeing the first signs of any intrusive behavior. If somebody's showing up at your workplace or if they're showing up at your school, if they're asking your family members or your friends information about you, uh, those are the, you know, surefire signs of like intrusive behavior that's not wanted and to set a very clear boundary from the very start that you don't appreciate this and um, really sticking with your boundaries and um, showing the person that you are serious and kind of staying calm and cool and collected as opposed to, you know, showing them any kind of fear. But setting those boundaries early on is really important before the situation escalates and becomes dangerous. What happens once the situation escalates? Yeah, you know, they've tried intruding into their life. What kind of advice do you give them then? Um, to really seek help, whether that, you know, seeing a mental health professional or advocates. Um, I know there's a lot of agencies and associations that are now offering help for specifically for stalking victims and a lot of uh, domestic abuse resources because they kind of really do go hand in hand. Um, stalking can of course happen from a complete st stranger, but oftentimes it's more common for it to be with someone that the victim has had a previous relationship with. And, um, it can go on for a long, long time. That takes a huge toll on the victim psychologically in every way. Um, there's been studies that have linked, you know, stalking victims to developing depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, because it really is a trauma to go through so something like this, to be stalked, you're kind of being stripped away of your autonomy as a person. And, you know, feeling safe is a fundamental need in life. And without it, it we have a whole host of issues, anxiety, panic disorder, agoraphobia, to the which is, you know, the fear of leaving the house. And so victims can end up not wanting to leave the house. They end up wanting to isolate. Um, and a lot of them might start to self-medicate to deal with that anxiety. So I think the biggest thing is to stay educated and to speak up and tell people that you trust, friends and family that you trust that can look out for you to have a safety plan and, um, you know, to really trust your instincts. And if something doesn't feel right, it's not to take threats very seriously. And, you know, if, you are in danger to contact the police. What is the best way to leave um, a situation with somebody that maybe is abusive that you're worried about? They could stalk you later or hurt you. 
I mean, it's, and that's a great question, but it's just complicated because not every stalking situation is the same and not every stalker is the same, but, um, you know, being in a abusive relationship and wanting to leave, um, is, is a huge challenge. It's like this vicious cycle, right? And a lot of women are afraid to even leave because of this or because of being hurt even more if they do leave. And so I think in this regard, we need a lot more, um, even more resources, even more advocacy and even more like laws to put in place to be able to protect people and more mental health awareness, because this is a huge issue where a lot of women are afraid to, uh, leave an abusive situation for fear of what's to come after, whether they're going to be stalked or, you know, hurt even worse. Roz, you had mentioned touching upon social media and how they can play in these situations. Can you kind of dive into that a little bit for us? Cyber stalking is also like on a sharp rise and, um, that can also have the same uh, negative impacts on mental health as in-person stalking. Like if somebody's like threatening to release like videos of you, or if they keep sending emails or, um, blackmailing you through social media. Um, that's a huge issue of itself, but also it's also aiding in the, you know, increasing of in-person stalking because, at you know, everybody's posting where they are at all times, who they're with. We have geotags. Uh, a lot of people's social media accounts are on public. And so this can really be problematic in a situation where there's a stalker involved because they have all this information about you at their fingertips. When you were dealing with different, you know, college students, was that the the primary form of harassment or bullying or even stalking that they were dealing with? I can't speak too specifically about the clients that I also had just because of confidentiality um, reasons. But I think people who, you know, stalkers, it, they, it can be from multiple different reasons. And, but I think the biggest takeaway is to understand that these people are not in touch with reality and it's, they have obsessive thoughts and that could be for a variety of different reasons, uh, depending on the person. But like, I think that's the biggest takeaway is that you can't try to reason with them. And uh, because that connection to reality is really not there. And they have these obsessive thoughts and these patterns. And when they get fixated on something, that's all they can think about. And they have an inability to understand other people's boundaries and even really understand what their actions are doing sometimes. Can you touch more on what maybe you've studied or what you've learned about that obsessive behavior that stalkers have? Yeah. I mean, like I said, it could be different where one, for one person, they could be predators and it could be that they really do see you as a possession that's theirs and they own you. And it's like, um, that's where all that comes with like, Oh, if I can't have you, then nobody can. And there's a sense of entitlement and, um, who knows what kind of story they're creating in their minds or that sense of like power over another human being. Um, uh, that fear is like really dry. The fear that they're invoking in their victim is really giving, making them feel powerful. Or there can be other situations where the person um, just cannot read social cues, cannot understand that they uh, their actions are not wanted, and it's the the story they have in their mind about the relationship they have with the victim is very different. So it can be, you know different things for different situations. What's some advice that you would give somebody if they came to you and they had been in a relationship with somebody who's now stalking them? Um, Obviously like to take safety measures first, they know their situation better than anyone to really know, like, are they be, you know, receiving threats if they're receiving threats to take them seriously, but definitely to have a safety plan in place and to reach out, reach out, reach out, whether that be to trusted family, friends, or, the police or mental health, like if they're coming to me, I would tell them to like seek other resources to ensure their safety. But I also think it's because when you're in a situation where you're being stalked, I think there's this fear and there's, you feel paralyzed with the fear. And so you're not doing anything uh, because in a way you feel like you can't do anything. And I think a lot of victims struggle with this uh, because 
in a sense, your power is being taken away from you, or at least that's how it seems. Because like, as I said, your, your autonomy as a person is stripped away, like your rights and, you know, privacy is completely violated and that can really mess with a victim's mind. And to remind them that, you know, while we don't have control over other people's actions, um, you know, we can try to control, take into control how we respond to the situation. And I think even like Kate mentioned in her, in her story, and that was really cool. is like, she finally took matters into her own hands and started making phone calls. And that's really when things started to change for her, when she decided to start fighting back. And that can be very scary, but, um, I think that's, you know, necessary not to say like to, to engage with the stalker specifically yourself, but to really start taking the steps to show that you are being proactive in this situation. How important do you think that, you know, getting therapy after something like this would be? Um, yeah, it's, it's very important. Like I said, that this, those symptoms can really last because they can really change how you look at the world, like in terms of like not being, you know, mistrusting everybody, always like looking over your shoulder, um, becoming suspicious. So going to therapy is really important so that, you know, when you're in a situation where you're being stalked and it's so scary, you, we, you develop these coping uh, mechanisms to be able to deal with the situation. And uh, oftentimes after that situation is passed, we take those coping mechanisms with us, but they're not adaptive anymore. At that point, they've become maladaptive and they're hurting us now instead of protecting us. And therapy really serves as a great tool of, you know, self-reflection and or realizing and becoming self-aware. Uh, but I also think what you said is great about becoming a survivor rather than a victim. And uh, the field of psychology, there's actually this, uh, something called post-traumatic growth, which uh, refers to a person's ability to really um, be able to find their strength after going through something traumatic and being able to, um, you know, have that resiliency to overcome. And a lot of, uh, survivors actually end up doing a lot of work, uh, to heal themselves, but also to help other people who have gone through similar situations, just like, Hey, and I feel like going through that and really speaking up about your story and telling your story when you've gone through something like this is really empowering and it can really help in the healing process as well. And help you with the transition of going from victim to a survivor and someone who took control of their story and now they're sharing it and trying to make a difference so that other people don't have to go through the same things can, and can be, you know, really empowering to people. Many of the guests that we have on the show are mm -hmm. still being stalked. We're trying to figure out a way to give them, you know, ways to like cope, but mm -hmm. at the same point, um, you know, what they can do in their daily lives to kind of battle this, even if the stalker is not there, this trauma is still the residual Absolutely. effect in their lives. So, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, for one, I think this is great that you guys are doing this podcast because it provides a platform for people to be able to come and tell their story and also hear about other people's stories because stalking is actually quite common. Um, it starts very early. I think, um, uh, I think early, before the age of 25 and it can go on for such a long time. So I think the fact that we're raising awareness because a lot of cases actually go under reported and then they don't get reported because people are scared to speak up as we talked about. But I think that, um, hearing other people's stories, uh, especially for those that have maybe overcome it can be, you know, like a light at the end of the tunnel to, to show them that, you know, this is something that can be overcome, even though when you're in the situation, it feels like it's never going to end. And, um, you are just exhausted and completely worn out with fear of when the next time the stalker might show up or whatever it may be, but to, um, remind themselves to be proactive and to take those daily steps and to take care of themselves and to also, you know, understand that, the negative emotions that they're having are normal, you know, they're normal responses to a devastating situation, but that, um, there is ways to heal and, um, it doesn't always have to be like this. It's important to know that when you're going through this, it might be, uh, your tendency to self blame and to think, what did I do to um, deserve this? And that can hinder you from 
reaching out for help, but it's important to know that this can happen to anyone and that it's not your fault. Um, and you do deserve to have support through this. Nobody should go through this alone and to know that there really is help out there. Absolutely. No, that's great advice. So Roz, if someone wants to find out more about you and some of your mental health blog, where would they find it? Uh, it's mentalwealthla.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This was a pleasure. Again, if anyone would like to learn more about Roz at her mental health blog, her website is www.mentalwealthla.com. That's M-E-N-T-A-L-W-E-A-L-T-H-L-A.com. If anyone out there is in need of help or is a victim of stalking, please reach out. You can find a list of resources, including a link to Roz's website on our Instagram at Strictly Stalking Pod. You can watch all of our episodes on YouTube at www.youtube.com slash Strictly Stalking. I'm Jake Deptula. And I'm Jamie Beebe. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Strictly Stalking.